Hello, I am Lux, and this is... Ember, not to be confused with Cinder. <laughs> and this is our thoughts on Ruby, Chapter 5, Episodes 1 and 2. This show just keeps getting prettier. I think they're getting used to the software now. And not just used to the software, but figuring out where to make cuts in the animation without doing season one black blob background people. Like the panning shots in Haven, the people themselves weren't animated, but they were very well illustrated. Mm -hmm. And they also used parallax and perspective very well in the shots. So you really still felt like they were 3D, but you could tell that they were hand-drawn compared to Ruby and the gang. Also, that shot when they first came through the door, I was like, that's like a scene from a video game, man. Very much so. It even included that loading screen that goes right after you go into a new room where they take the time while they're loading to show you stuff that's really simple. And another thing that's improved is the voice actor for Adam Torres. He feels so much more natural in that role now compared to the end of chapter three, I believe it was. When he's talking to Blake, he felt so forced evil there. This one, he now sounds sinister evil. Yes, and very natural. So I'm glad that the voice actor was able to get whatever he did done to portray that role in a much more in-depth manner. And I'm beginning to like Hazel. He may be a bad guy, but I think he's one of those bad guys that's a bad guy for a very good reason. Oh, see, I was starting to like him last season when he helped Oscar. Yes, but just the no need to die today. And yes, we're going right to the end of the second episode, but these are important points that stuck in my head after watching. Yes, so I very much like that because he was like, no one needs to die today. You know, vouching for Adam and then ending it with his closing line after... Adam pulls that stunt and forcibly takes over the White Fang that no one needed to die today. For Hazel, violence always has to have a reason, and he doesn't see any reason that Adam needed to kill the High Leader. I liked her design, too. Pity we got to see it for such a short period of time. Though, now that that happened, I have a feeling that that's who's portrayed in the picture that Ilya appears to be praying in front of. Hmm. In the intro title sequence. Yeah, and I think we can see once again that the intro is telling us about the season. Very much so, which is why they waited till the end of the first episode to show it to us. Well, they've done that for the past couple of chapters. They show the intro after the first episode. Yes, I know. And I'm saying I think it's holding true to form because the team's definitely getting back together. There's still going to be tension between Yang and Blake. You can see that the way the shots cut from Blake to Yang and the way the rose petals go. Mm. The color pattern of the transition there is different than it was between the first two members. Speaking of the intro, I also like that shot of Yang. That's like the most kicktail shot of Yang in that entire like, whoa. And she's just standing still and looking. You're like, yeah. Dark alley? No. <laughs> Brightly lit alley? No. <laughs> Just no, no, no. I'm, I'm going to be quietly over here. And speaking of Yang, was that guy made of rubber? Because that was a very comedic punch that apparently took out a front tooth. And it's just, wow. That was awesome. I love how they always give her a Western theme. Like she's in a Western. Wow. Yeah. Even though she's around the others, whenever she does something, it's like she belongs in a Western. <laughs> Very much so, because she's at the bar, and trouble starts, and she deals with it very calmly, though she seems to be having some issues with her power there. I think it's less her power and more her nerves. She's still recovering from the fact that her arm got chopped off by Adam. And I have a feeling when she encounters Adam again, even if she's mostly recovered, she's going to have a freeze, and something's going to happen to someone else. Like Ruby, Blake, or Wise, I'm guessing either Blake or Ruby, to kick her back into, okay, I'm going to punch his head off. Quite literally, his head will go flying off after I punch it. His body will stay where he was. And the head will be detached because nobody messes with my friends or my baby sister. 
that or he'll go to cut her again and with her new robotic hand, she'll grab the sword and break it. I'm perfectly okay with either of those. And the designs are really working in this season, especially with the little tweaks they've done to previous designs and updates they've done to characters. Like, Adam's outfit has pockets now. It has the same design on the back of it, but it's sleeker. It has a pocket with a zipper on it. So they've updated his design a little bit more, and it works better with the new software. But they've also tweaked uh, a little bit on Crow's, since his was an original design brought over from the previous software. It looks better now. So designs like Crow's that they brought over don't stand out like they used to. And designs we haven't seen much of, like Mercury, still look a little bit better because he was in the intro. So they're obviously doing something to make the old designs look better in the new season. So we'll just move on from that and go back to the pacing in these two episodes were handled so much better. And the transitions between each character went so smoothly. Very, very smoothly. Just the pacing, the overall layout and design of how they put out the storyboard and what scene they touched on when. Also that we got to have Oscar walking into the bar with Crow again. They actually used scenes from the end of last chapter that they have after the credits in the beginning of this chapter. So it's like, that's neat. I like how they reincorporated those to really give us like, oh, also how drunk Crow was. Yeah, so I'm like, how much alcohol did that take? Because it was established when Crow first showed up that Crow is always drunk. So how much more does it take to go from always drunk to flat on your tail drunk? <laughs> Comedic timing. I found him! <laughs> yes, and how much time will it take before the children, for lack of a better term, believe that Oscar is Ozpin. Yeah, because we ended with, ah, poof, and everyone's still going, huh? When mm -hmm. we cut to a different scene. Yes, and a nice touch that Oscar's first words to Ruby are, you have silver eyes, which were Ozpin's first words to Ruby. And I like how, can a girl read her comics in peace? <laughs> that was very Ruby chippy. Mm-hmm. Of course, my brain also jumps back to, now that's a katana. <laughs> And knowing Ruby, it probably was actually a katana. Uh -huh. And I also love when they're panning over the town. She's like, look at all the weapons. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't even notice. No, are there actually weapons in those shots? I don't know. Just these two episodes, they don't feel like they're as short as they are. The first one was 22 minutes, and I think the next one was 21. They're actually getting closer to full, actual full-length episodes now, because back before they were like, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15, five. <laughs> Yes, because you could reasonably, if they were all stitched together, you could watch chapter one in about an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. They usually showed it in theaters like that. All of chapter one as a single solid cut. And if you looked at chapter one, they actually made it that way. The way that episodes, at least the first five or six, will just directly edit into each other. I know, I noticed that and did it myself. <laughs> I did a little all the episodes and then put them together. Wow, that just cuts right into each other. Yes, yeah, so everything that appears to be a shortcut in the earlier chapters isn't nearly as much as a shortcut as you think it is. Because they've planned this series out for like 10 chapters. I know they have planned it out, I just can't remember how many. 10 chapters is probably a good number. Yes, yes, and especially when you go back and listen to some of the lyrics, it's like, wow. So Yang was really going to get a robotic arm from the very beginning. Really? You picked up on that? Going backwards, there's allusions to Transformers, along with the Dragon Ball Z allusions in her song. Hmm. If they ever somehow use the Transformers sound effect when Yang does something with her arm, that's going to be neat. Yeah. No, it's in the very first lyric. Come at me and you'll see I'm more than meets the eye. You think you'll break me, but you're going to find out in time. Ooh, that even alludes to the whole arm being cut off. You think you broke me. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's like in retrospect. This is why we started to pay really close attention to the intros, because we noticed this like on chapters two and three, where we're like, wait a minute, all the stuff we saw in this season was in the intro. We're going to pay attention to that more now. 
And it's in the lyrics too, not just the visuals, but it's both the visuals and the lyrics mm -hmm. giving hints to the relationships and who's going to interact with whom and what way the season's going to go. We knew chapters three and four were going to be a downturn for the heroes, but you listen to the song in chapter five, we're making a comeback. Especially the end where it says, basically, you'll have victory. And the first couple lyrics is back to the fantasy. Mm -hmm. And in fantasy, the good guys always win. And it even says when our backs are against the wall, basically, because they back to this, back to that, back against the wall. And then they talk about how we're going to fight from there. So by the sound of that, probably midway through the season, all the heroes are going to be like pinned against a metaphorical wall. And they're going to power up and it's suddenly going to be Super Saiyan 3 across the board. <laughs> or whatever Super Saiyan level they currently are and Dragon Ball Super. I've barely watched the first episode on that. I hear it's really good, but once again, time. Also, it's Dragon Ball Z. It's kind of like, that's still around? Yeah, and I've heard good things about the latest movie and this series. Apparently, both this series and that movie were actually written by the guy who actually did Dragon Ball. You know, the original guy. Akira Toriyama. So that's good, because apparently he had no real interaction with any of the actual TV series. He just authorized them. But that also explains what happened with GT, because he had nothing to do with that one. It wasn't even authorized. Okay, so away from Dragon Ball and back to Ruby. I was just about to say that. So, any nitpicks? Uh, I know there's always nitpicks, but I say it that way just in case you one day say, actually, no. Extremely mild. They keep updating the graphics. This season's so much prettier than last season. It, it's going to be kind of painful to go back and watch seasons one, two, and three at this point because it just keeps getting prettier. Kind of like going back and watching the first season of My Little Pony compared to this season. They're still using the same software in MLP. And you're like, that's Flash? God, they must be breaking at this point, which is why I hear that they may be using the software they used for the movie from now on, because they've done all they can with Flash, and it's become so unstable that it's hard for them to keep up the production schedule they have. And I said all of that in one breath. <laughs> oh, just all the attention to detail, the battle damage on Ruby's cloak, the shadows and the layout and the light effects and the water effects. Water effects were a little weak in the Haven shots in the wide pan view. The overall movements, the way they worked to remind us of things that happened back in chapter four. And we had the actual replay of the scene with Oscar slash Osbin and Crow. But we also had Lionheart's behavior all these small little touches that remind us of what happened in chapter four. Sun and Blake's father arguing in that perfect in unison, we're getting along in this one area and bringing Alita back to talk to Blake. There's all these reminders of what happened and making it feel like it just happened, that we haven't been on hiatus because it's all right there and immediate. Weiss being on the cargo ship, us getting more information that he's doing an illegal run, so of course that's why he's willing to take Weiss. He's already skirting the law. So hopefully he's still alive, because obviously he and Weiss got separated. Though this is going to be an awesome opportunity for Weiss to subvert the Spring Maiden back to our side. Yeah, and I feel sorry for Weiss. Why is it always the face? Also, she was already down. Was that really necessary, Raven? No, oh, I can already see how they're going to get everyone together. <laughs> Through the bandits, apparently, because everyone's heading there. Because <laughs> Yang's after her mother. Wise is now kidnapped, as it were. Ruby is headed there, and I'm, I have a feeling Blake's going to head there thanks to the White Fang. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how Blake is going to get tied in, because if you look at the intro... They give us kind of a season three, season, sorry, chapter four, chapter five thing. Because the intro in chapter four, we see her on the ship. The intro in chapter five, we show her and son looking out over water. So you think they're on a ship again, but that time they pan out and they're on a grouping of islands. And that reminds me, the camera work in this season is fantastic. 
They know when to pull out. They know when to hold a shot close. They know when to shake the camera, when to tilt the camera. The angles they need to best show off some of the really nice action scenes. Something Ruby has always been good with. That was the thing that got me into the season in the first place. How solid the action shots are. That was the thing that was in the trailers. The first, like, three trailers were just fights. Though if you go back to them now, you're like, oh, there was a story in there. Yeah, because totally didn't realize that at the time. Though it took me forever to get around to watching the black trailer. I started with the ruby trailer, sorry, red trailer, then white, then yellow. And I didn't get around to black until, like, season two. Speaking of which, we both have the actual trailers to this season to watch still. Well, we'll probably put those in the follow-up that we usually do for these seasons. Yeah, I'll touch on it more in the end summary type thing. Because it's 13 episodes for shows that are not MLP. We usually do two episodes at a time, so episode 13 is going to stand by itself. So we'll have some room there. Let's see. Hmm. Well, I think we were still on your nitpicks. <laughs> I don't really have a lot. That communications grim is creepy as all get out, and apparently Miss Creepy can control it because she used it to attack Lionheart. Mm, and that reminds me, I need to listen to season one again, but I think the voice actress for Cinder is different in this chapter. Which is possible and also makes sense. I hope if it did change, it was on good terms. But she's recovering. She wasn't able to speak in Chapter 4. So a change in the way her voice sounds makes sense for what has happened to the character. And the voice actress for Cinder did a really nice job of when you first start to hear her, you can really tell she's still working hard to speak. It still takes effort for her to speak. At least more effort than it takes for us. I mean, listen to us right now! <laughs> You no, know, so it's still an effort for her, but she is managing to vocalize. And they added something. Instead of just the scar, she now has some type of face mask that's covering the scar underneath her hair. If there was ever any doubt, she has completely lost that eye. I'm still surprised how much she survived after what happened to her. I mean, that Grim was entirely turned to stone. Well, I think if she hadn't absorbed the Fall Maiden's power, she would have been a total goner. Oh, well, that reminds me about some theories for Jean and his power, his semblance. How it might actually be polarity like Pyrrha was, because she was also the one who helped unlock his power. Yeah, they still haven't explained how Pyrrha was able to unlock his semblance, and we've never seen a clear demonstration of his semblance that we know of. Another part of the theory that makes me think that may be valid is the fact that he's one of the few that has complete metal armor and weapons. Everyone else is some type of composite or something like that. He has an old-fashioned weapon. He has an old-fashioned shield that's only been updated with Pyrrha's metal. So that's like, hmm, yeah, it would be kind of interesting if his power actually is polarity like hers was. Another connection back to Pyrrha and maybe another connection that gives us more about the whole... Where his name comes from, too. Joan of Arc. So we'll see. Oh, and I just realized something. We don't see much of Jean, Ren, or Nora, except for that one part in the intro where the new Oz pin's in the background. Where it's Nora hanging upside down and being goofy, and then you cut over to Jean and Ren off to the side, and then you look over at Oscar transitioning to Ozpin. And she's, like, almost booping Crow. <laughs> Remember, when she boops you, she's saying, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Except when it's with a hammer to the face. So I think that means they are less important in this season because there was a lot of shots of the main four compared to everyone else. With the previous chapter, they had a lot of shots of both. Team Ruby and Team Juniper. So I think Team Juniper is going to overall have less screen time slash story input this season. Not that they aren't still going to be valuable because we've lost so many huntsmen and huntresses and they're all good fighters. And Jean is a great strategist. So they're going to need his help to do this whole take on the bandits thing because Crow's just going to want to run in with overwhelming force where Rin is trying to find a more diplomatic solution and Nora is, you know, hit it with a hammer. Hmm. 
It just struck me. Another part of the intro is when Ren is fighting Hazel in the intro. I'm like, hmm, those two could get along well if they weren't fighting. Those two could get along quite well. I'm not sure that Arthur has any redeeming qualities yet, but Hazel has potential. Just to make sure Arthur's the guy in the green outfit, right? Yes, who's leaving to fix Turian's tail. Yeah, that guy just, something about him. I think he's one of those people who's like evil for evil's sake kind of thing. Like, oh, I like the idea of power. That That's his motivation. Yes, but it's interesting that he has a name like Arthur, because all I can think of right now is King Arthur. So what is he a king of? And I love how they use those kind of names for bad guys as well. Like, Cinder is literally Cinderella. That's what her name comes from. Kind of makes sense is too. Soot, ash, fire. But that's usually a good character. So does that mean that she's going to get redeemed at one point? Or is this what happens when your fairy tale goes wrong? Ooh, ooh, that's a good one. I like that. I love your ideas. The um, 500 Kingdoms novels by Mercedes Lackey. Ah, I remember you mentioning other novels too, where they used tricks to subvert what would have happened to them because of the fairy tale. Same series. Ah, what was your favorite moment for these two episodes? <laughs> well, seeing Oscar confront Crow again, there's so much in that because Crow's busy trying to get drunk and here's this kid and then I feel like we saw so much more detail in Crow's expression this time than we did as opposed to the closing in chapter four. Hmm. Well, they do edit it to keep some secrets. Mm-hmm. I'm saying there was just a lot more depth there. And of course, Yang punching out the guy. Oh, yeah. That's my favorite scene because I was like, is that guy made out of rubber? Is that his semblance? What? Was he sent there specifically because he could get hit by Yang and live? (laughs) And it was also awesome that she managed to punch him out and cause absolutely no damage to the shop. Mm -hmm. I was expecting to hear pinball sounds when he was hitting stuff. I love how the guy's on the house. He's been bugging me all day. (laughs) And I do like, I'm supposed to tell you, I want my cane back. (laughs) (laughs) Just Crow going, I found him. (laughs) And also, we now know for sure that Osbin is not the spring maiden. So he's not spring and he's not fall. And that reminds me, I think that lady we see across from Cinder in the intro is the spring maiden. Very likely. So that tells me that especially since they were kind of looking at each other, not in an antagonistic way, but more of in a slightly agreeable way, though the Spring Maiden kind of had a more of a smirk on her face. Well, she has been hanging around Raven for the past 10 years. And Cinder also had kind of like, yeah. So I don't think they were getting along, but I don't think they were against each other. No, it's more of, hmm, okay. I can see where this might be useful. Ah, I see you're a maiden. Yes, I'm also a maiden. I hate the responsibility. So do I. Hey, you want to go blow stuff up? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, let's go do that. (laughs) Uh... And also the reminder that Cinder got that she has to hone and protect her own powers because I can't think of her name. Miss Creepy Lady Behind the Scenes can only do so much to protect her. Also demonstrating the power of manipulation, not only saying to Cinder that there is value in others, but the actual manipulation of Lionheart and then turning around and manipulating Cinder right at that exact moment. They really show how manipulative she is and how good she is at it. I just love Ruby's enthusiasm for like everything in the beginning of the first episode. And I love how everyone, as soon as Oscar asked for Ruby Rose, was like, and why do you want to know? Mm-hmm. An instant defensive stance. Because the last person who came looking for Ruby Rose wanted to kill her. And they are very good friends. Yes. So they're like, we will protect her to our dying breath. And then, hi guys, I found him. Because <laughs> I think her uncle could use some help. That was so awesome. Because I expected him to come out of the shadows, not from the side. Yeah, I was expecting him to step forward, not come in from the side. Because of the way they framed it, they left a lot of empty space above Oscar's head. So that usually indicates something's going to happen behind him, which was a good misdirection of someone coming from the side. Also, I thought it was going to be more important that that yellow dust bullet was on the ground of the cargo bay when Weiss was loading up her sword. 
Well, if you looked at it, they were cartridges. So she was loading what was in the cartridge into her thing because you also saw a red and a blue one fall to the ground after she went chunk. Yeah, but at first it almost looked like she missed loading yellow because her weapon uses several different colors of dust. And that fight was awesome! I was like, we're going to be summoning something. We're going to be summoning something. Okay, the cargo bay is empty. We're going to be summoning something! And I'm like, how would her summoning work in this situation? Because as far as we know, she doesn't have an airborne creature to summon. So how is she going to pull this off? We have to have her pull it off because we know that she's mastered her summoning ability. Or at least gotten to a point where she can actually summon something. It may not mean she's mastered it, it means she's gotten confident enough in it that she can actually use it. Right. And then we see her actually do the summoning and holy, oh wow, dissolve, reform, bouncing off of the circles just like she does. And oh, yep, there's the sword. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure that's the same creature that fought her in the first trailer we ever saw of her. Yes, I wasn't 100% because when we first saw it be summoned, it was without the sword. And every other time the sword has been there. Because when she managed the partial summon, it was the arm with the sword. And when we see her complete the summon in chapter 4 and the creature kneels down to her, it's with the sword in the downward position of kneeling to one's liege lord or monarch or some other sort of superior. So to see the summon without the sword, I was like, hmm, I'm not 100%. And then the sword, okay, yeah, I'm 100%. Anything else you'd like to go over, or should we wrap it up with our final thoughts? Well, the thing is, this is the best time to throw out our theories, because there aren't enough episodes out yet for people to call hacks on us. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a total maybe of four on the Rooster Teeth site, but there's three on YouTube, so there may be four by now. Yes, by the time this is posted, there will probably be four available. Speaking of theories, may as well go into that. What are your current ones, other than the ones we've been tossing out along the way because of the intro? Yeah, so team gets together. I think Blake's going to join last because that one's going to rock the team the most because there's still unfinished business between Blake and Yang. We're going to have some side switching or at least some temporary camaraderie, Ren and Hazel, and things with Aelita and Blake are going to get rough. I'm thinking somebody might have to die. Or at least get seriously injured. Very much so, because we can see from the trailer that Aelita is conflicted. And she's probably going to be more so conflicted after the High Leader's death, especially if she learns the truth of the High Leader's death. But if all she has is the lie mm. that a human killed the High Leader. And that was very mean of Adam. I have a feeling if he gives a direct name, it's going to be Hazel. Yes, because Hazel was physically present. And even those who were not there to witness Adam's murder of the High Leader could attest to Hazel being somewhere within that location. So, yeah, Adam is trying to do his own plotting, but he's also still trying to keep the power of the Evil Queen Lady. I'm going to call her the Evil Queen Lady right now because I can't remember her name. Just like, you can't. God, it's something evil. Mm -hmm. But to me, she feels like a queen because of the outfit and how she acts. Very much so. So, yeah, I have very similar theories, and the team's definitely going to get back together, if not in the later half of the season, at least in the final episode. And we may not get an actual fight with them versus the Queen Lady. I don't think we're going to get to the Queen yet, because we still have the relics to deal with. So it's still going to be versus underlings, but with higher tier underlings, because... Tyrion, Arthur, Hazel, and the other guy are higher up than Cinder was at the time that Cinder was interacting with Team Ruby. So yeah, we're definitely going to get some heavy confrontations between all these major characters that we've been introduced to. And we're going to get some really neat battles. <laughs> I know that's like standard for Ruby, but I have a feeling with the way they're using the software right now and what they've been doing with it in these first two episodes... The major fights at the end of the chapter are going to be outstanding. Yeah, because just look at how well-coordinated Weiss's battle against the Lancers was. 
Though that also brings up a weird question I had in my head. I know they're insect grim, but they have strategies. It's almost like they're being controlled by someone. Didn't you notice that? The Queen Lancer was coordinating them. Hmm. I thought she was asleep until Wise cast that spell to break all the rubble and knock out the other ones. Uh, to me, it came across more as the Queen Lancer was coordinating them, and then when she got those signals back that that many of her Lancers were taken out, she jumped in. Hmm. Yeah, I can see that now. Well, final thoughts? Uh, this show just keeps looking better. The story looks like it's feeling really solid. I hope this is enough action to placate the people who didn't think anything happened in Chapter 4 because apparently subtlety doesn't work for some people. <laughs> I think they were complaining more about how, like, nothing's going on in the story. Everything seems to be confusing because we're switching between all these people and stuff like that. I'm like, you weren't paying attention, were you? <laughs> There's so much going on in here. And I'm not just reading into it because... All of it came true! So, that's not reading into it. Yeah, it looks like they know how to handle the split characters better. The fact that Ruby's team is all over the place, because the transitioning between all of them was done fantastically in these first two episodes. I barely even felt the transition this time. Last season, it felt really separate because they were, like, breaking it up. We were doing... Ruby and Wise this episode. We're doing Yang and Blake in this episode. And then we would go back to Ruby and Wise or Ruby and Yang. It was definitely a solid split. You could feel when it was happening. Well, I think some of that was actually deliberate because the team was broken up. Everything needed to feel discordant. Hmm. In this season, the transitions between locations and people was just not noticeable at all. It went so smooth. I'm like, wow. This season's going to be good. Also, um, touching back on music briefly, the song that plays during Weiss's battle, it's the end credit song. And it's very much you are back on your game because you failed, your training failed you, you've had to come back. And this has been our thoughts on Ruby, Chapter 5, Episodes 1 and 2. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, share, comment, Check out other videos. Enjoy Lex's art? You can find more of it on DeviantArt, Tumblr, Twitter, those are pretty steady, uh, Google+, Facebook, a couple Mastodon servers, Reddit, those ones we can't really schedule so they're not quite as consistent. Really enjoy Lex's art and would like his help in taking that picture in your head and making it a digital reality? He does take commissions. Please check the link below for pricing and availability. Would like to support us financially, but out of ideas at the moment? Uh, we do take donations through Patreon and Coffee. Patreon starts at a dollar, which includes monthly quick sketches and voting rights on future sketches. And Coffee is a single payment and works in increments of three. Thanks again for listening.